Good evening. I'm Casey Nolan, and tonight on Stay Tuned, it is performance review time for lawmakers. Our legislative sessions are coming to an end, but will our lawmakers have all of their work done before they go home? Lawmakers in Jefferson City have been busy, especially this week. Everything from gun control to education to Medicaid has been debated, but with the legislature set to adjourn tomorrow, there has been a push for action. Big issues like liquor law changes and highway bonds were still on the table as late as yesterday. There was even buzz about banning the seersucker. But what really made headlines this session were Missouri's decision not to expand Medicaid and the recent controversy surrounding the sharing of certain information with the federal government. Tonight we're asking, what do you need to know? And how are the decisions of our lawmakers really going to impact your life and your bottom line? And later, we go outside Missouri to check out what's happening in Illinois. This and more tonight, so stay tuned. So if you're new to Stay Tuned, we need you to know that you're a big part of the show if we're going to pull off what we're trying to pull off here via social media. This is Ed Reggie, and he's the guy that makes it all happen between social media and broadcast, and it's already kind of happening this it week. It is already happening. In fact, it has been blowing up. I'm going to use that term just all over Twitter uh, and Facebook tonight. In fact, uh, the conversation has started with some photographs. In fact, we have some full screen photographs, uh, already a hot topic right here. You can see that there's a vigil, a luminary vigil held for those who supported the expansion of Medicaid. In fact, Matt has said one for every life that could have been saved if Moleg have passed Medicaid. So uh, expansion and another photo, a photo is the, of course the seersucker suit which is making headlines. I'm sorry, that the, that is actually a different photo. That's the, that's the top of the rotunda? That's the top of the rotunda. P people are saying on Twitter, apparently some sort of practical joke of, uh, of an outline of a, a nothing like a, it looks like some kind of person, an outline of a person who's, uh, again, maybe this is a statement on Medicaid okay. as well. And then the seersucker suit is next up, I believe, yes. And this is actually from uh, uh, Jed Jets uh, Jetson, I think it is. I'm, I hope I'm getting it right from uh, his friend Sam Licklider, I think it is, and look, Rod Jetton. So sorry, I think it's a representative. It's, the handle and the name are hard to distinguish sometimes. It is, but this yeah. is a demonstration that these could become illegal uh, in our state. So the conversation is happening, and I want you to continue. And you can, I'm engaging with you throughout the night, and there's two ways you can do it. You can go log on our Facebook page, The Nine Network. We put a question up there. Put your comments, your feedback, your personal stories. What do you think? Uh, about this uh, this session. Also, Twitter, you can use the hashtag stay tuned STL. And tonight, we're also using the hashtag MoLeg as well. So please use both of those and let's see what you're already saying. Well, tonight's show, our topic is happening while we're talking about it. So we want to go to Jeff City via Google Hangout with uh, a couple of journalists who have been covering this legislative session uh, because it is still going on, and that's why they are there. Jason Rosenbaum from the St. Louis Beacon joining us once again, and Scott Fawn from the Missouri Times. Uh, two points of clarification before we get started. Hashtag MoLeg does not need, mean that we need the, either of you uh, to show us any more leg. Uh, we would like you to keep your pants rolled down. Uh, and also, I believe the seersucker, we'll get to that in a little bit. They, that, that was a bit of a controversy, if you will, a little bit of a, uh, some fun our lawmakers were having within the legislative body. Casey, when I'm on with you, I always am wearing pants. Okay, well, sure. there we go. And, and I'm a little disappointed. I was hoping to see some calf of Rosenbaum. That's kind of what I was on here for. Very good. Congratulations. This show is officially off the rails. Thank you both for joining us. Good night, everyone. I'm sorry I started that. Uh, okay, well, let, catch us up to speed. You guys are in Jeff City because this is all still going on. What, I know they went late into the night, last night and maybe another night before that. Are they still on the floor right now? 
The uh, House is not on the floor. Uh, they've left. Uh, they're waiting on some conference reports from the Senate. They'll be back at 10 a.m. The Senate still is uh, deliberating. Uh, but you know what I keep hearing around the Capitol is it's uh, a little bit anticlimactic. Most of the big issues that aren't done, don't, don't, there are people are pretty pessimistic about them passing. So it's kind of, uh, it's kind of a eerie quiet for people that have been around the building for a long time. What they tell me is that they just don't have a lot of confidence that, that a lot of the last minute deal cutting is going to amount to anything. Yeah, anticlimactic is a, is a good word to, to use for this, mainly because, you know, anybody who's been around the Capitol these last couple of days of session will know that people are always racing and hurrying to get some big, important bill done. And while there are still bills that are left outstanding, a lot of the, the big priorities like tax cut, like second injury fund fix, and other ones, which I'm sure we'll talk about later, those have been done for a couple of days now. So it does have an eerie calm to it. And I, I, I've even had some moments today where I, I felt like I should be doing more or writing more because around this time usually a lot is happening and stuff is still happening but just not to that rocket ship importance that it usually happens. Okay so what has gotten done? You brought up a couple of things there. Tell us what what are the big headlines that you see as far as what's been accomplished, what's been what's been passed. Not, not that I something has to pass to be considered an accomplishment. Absolutely because some people would argue that you know lots of bills coming out of the legislature might not be a good thing. But some off the top of my head is that aforementioned change to the second injury fund. While that may not be an issue that sets the world afire, they've been literally trying to fix that issue for a few years now without success. And that ended up passing and going to the governor's desk today. That kind of fixes a, a vexing problem with a fund that typically helps injured workers. And this tax cut bill that passed last week that was a major priority for both the House and the Senate. It cut personal income taxes, business taxes, and corporate income taxes. The big question is if Nixon vetoes it like he signals that he would, whether they're going to try to override it in September. And I think that's going to be the biggest ticket uh, when that showdown occurs. The injury fund you're referring to, that goes way back to, I believe, World War II times. And that's something that there's been talk about reforming and, and, and fixing, if you will, for quite some time. And then, and, and Rod, go ahead, I'm sorry. And, and by the way, Rod, that was your tweet we saw just a minute ago. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, Scott, he, Rod is with your publication, Scott, forgive Absolutely, me. Absolutely, yes. So if you, if you want to clarify anything on, on that from the Missouri Times perspective uh, on the tweet there, I don't know if, if, if he's giving the inside oh, scoop I, on I what that was. I would never venture an attempt at clarifying or, or even really describing Rod's tweets. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Moving on, okay, so keeping with the conversation then, what, what else has been accomplished either by way of passage or not? Well, I think you point, I mean, I mean, the second injury fund is not a very sexy issue, but it certainly is, uh, is, is a hugely important one to the state. Uh, you had a lot of interest groups involved. I think there's a lot of business groups that aren't happy. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, I, I think all of them would agree that having some resolution to it uh, is better than the situation that's been, the cans have been kicked down the road for several years now. You know, a lot of the stuff I found the most interesting to cover this session was things that did not happen. There were several attempts to change um, the PSC's role in uh, regulating electric rates. Uh, that's not happened until it brought some drama this evening uh, through the gas isserus. There was uh, apparently a deal worked out to pass gas isserus to take out a tracker provision. Um, the chairman of the utilities committee got on the floor, very heated speech, um, condemned several of the uh, members that have traditionally been on the side of the uh, employers against the utilities. Uh, and it ended up being a 77-77 tie. Uh, no one had ever could remember seeing one of those. So that provision, um, it was an interesting thing. The uh, majority leader, speaker, several of the more influential members of the large sophomore class voted to, uh, to amend the bill and take off the tracker. Uh, most of the Democrat caucus and then some of the utility uh, supporters uh, put together an interesting coalition to make the vote tied. So at that point, the majority leader immediately laid the bill over. There was also a little bit of back and forth within the Republican Party, too, being that they controlled the, the House and the Senate concerning education. And I believe we saw some news coming out just literally in the last hour or so. Can you catch us up to speed on what's going on there? Some changes in, in education, uh, education legislation that really we haven't seen in this state in quite some time. And, and really, it's the interesting part about those bills is they affect mostly St. Louis and Kansas City. So Jason would probably be very good to address that. 
Well, there had been several instances throughout the session which Scott's publication detailed where so-called education reformers tried to change the way uh, teacher evaluations and tenure went forward. But those efforts didn't go anywhere. In fact, when they were on the House floor, they failed outright. And I think what ended up passing in recent days is a different education bill that changes how unaccredited school districts can kind of be taken over by the state or can, can essentially lead out of a, a, an accreditation. Um, and that, that to me is probably gonna be something that, that people kind of mull over after the session ends for sure. And, and some of what Scott was just talking about before then, uh, you know, there's a lot that goes on that does not grab the headlines. Uh, you know, talk about liquor laws. We've got highways have been uh, discussed and how we fund our highways. Some of the things that people may not have heard about so far this session that the legislature spent a lot of time on. Yeah, well, one, I, it, one, yeah one, one thing, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, <laughs> no, but, but one thing I really wanted to mention that hasn't gotten a lot of attention that did pass was legislation that effectively abolished St. Louis City and St. Louis County's foreclosure mediation ordinances. Mm -hmm. the, the two or three people that follow St. Louis County government know that when that was passed last year, that was a major, major thing the county council did. And this bill that was supported by both Republicans and some Democrats ended up getting to Jay Nixon's desk, admittingly surprisingly without a filibuster in the Senate. And Democratic senators told me, especially those who support foreclosure mediation, think that that's a way to help people stay in their homes. They were told by the governor's office or indirectly that the governor was gonna veto that, but it passed both chambers by huge majorities. So that'll be something that will may only affect Kansas, or St. Louis and uh, St. Louis County but it's definitely something that's going to have an impact if the governor signs it or if it's overwritten. I want to bring up something real quickly because we have just under a minute uh, to talk here. But Medicaid is something we've talked a lot about on this program. The governor's talked a lot about all around the state. Did they talk about it much in our legislature? I, I would say that's one story where the headlines were, were very much more plentiful than the serious discussion amongst uh, the leadership and the bodies. I'm not sure that there was ever a time when the leadership of either the House or the Senate seriously considered expanding Medicaid. I think it was discussed. I think they were certainly asked many questions about it. The governor, the Missouri Chamber, the Hospital Association all weighed in. But I, I think there's some plans for it to go after in the interim and then come back with a reform plan. They talked about some reform, but actually expanding Medicaid to the point where you'd qualify for these federal funds. Uh, I don't know that that was, dis that was actually discussed in the halls of this building as much as it was discussed other places. Uh, so that was one that's not, now one that did not maybe get as much ink, but was discussed heavily was the liquor bill for, uh, for I guess it helped major brands, a St. Louis employer. I, I just spoke to the mayor of St. Louis yesterday, who was in the halls for the second time I know of, and one of the main reasons was to lobby support uh, for that bill. So that, that's one where the coverage was maybe not on what was happening. All right, I'll jump in there, Scott. We'll have to tidy that up a little bit later in the show. For now, we're coming up in just a minute. We'll go back to Medicaid with the table here in the studio. But first, social media after I say thanks to Jason and Scott for joining us from the Capitol. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, we mentioned we were going to talk Medicaid uh, expansion, and we will, or the lack thereof, in the studio now. Introductions first, Jen Bursdale, Executive Director of Missouri Healthcare for All. Thank you for being here. Back on the show as well, uh, Patrick Warner, State Director for Americans for Prosperity. Maybe a little bit different viewpoint the two of you may have from different sides of the aisle, if you will, there. And Margaret Donnelly, a former state represent representative and uh, now with St. Louis University School of Law. We appreciate you all being here. I think we just heard from the from the Capitol that maybe we talk about it more here than they talked about it there. Uh, would you agree with that in, in, in the, the, what you've kept up with and following the legislature this session? Well, I think there was a lot of discussion by the advocates and by the community. I mean, there were people there all the time and out in the community as well 
talking about it, but I think that the statement that the leadership wasn't really discussing it seriously is a fair representation, but there was a lot of discussion going on by people who wanted it. And, and a demonstration, it looks like, tonight, with the, uh, we saw on Twitter with the candles on the steps. Right, a huge demonstration uh, set up with 1,500 candles, which is one for every life that, we, uh, that studies have shown will be lost every year that we delay expanding Medicaid. So, you know, of all of the things that our legislators talked about this year, this was the one that had the opportunity to alleviate the most suffering, to save the most lives, to create the most jobs, and to bring the most investment into the state. Uh, and so those that are involved in putting that vigil together really feel that our legislators dropped the ball on doing the most important thing they could have done this year. So if that's true, why didn't they? You know, I, I think we, before we really get into the discussion of whether they should or whether they shouldn't, I think we, a good starting point, and maybe sort of your first point or first question here, is why we're engaged in this discussion. Why is the state of Missouri and the 40 other states having to look at whether they're going to expand this Medicaid proposal as it relates to Obamacare and the Affordable Health Care Act or not? Uh, and, and to me, the starting point was when the Supreme Court ruled that states had the right to either do it or not do it, the right to say yes or no. Because, why? Because they ruled that the federal government basically were, was coercing the states into doing this, that you could not do that. And so I, you know, the, where I fall down from the starting point of this discussion is, if this was such a good deal, why did the federal government essentially try to coerce states into doing this? And the Supreme Court said, you know what, you, you overstepped your bounds. This is a victory for, for free, for state rights proponents. And let's let the states decide whether this is a good deal or not. So that's kind of why we're here and why we're having this discussion today. But the way the Affordable Care Act is put together, um, when the Supreme Court ruled that it was overly coercive, it's really a model that's been followed in Medicaid for years, which is that the federal government, in order to get an expansion in some service in Medicaid, gives the states an additional bonus or incentive, which is what they are doing. They are give, paying 100 percent of the cost for the first three years, and then a state will never have to pay more than 10 percent of the cost. And the act was put together so that you could get everyone up to 138 percent of poverty covered by Medicaid and the federal government was going to help you do that and then everybody above 138 percent wouldn't go into the exchanges and without opting to do the Medicaid expansion, Missouri's leaving a huge hole now for a large number of people. But, but, but I think that's, that is the point. It's, it was the carrot and stick approach as it comes to this, to this issue. The carrot was we're going to give you 100 percent of, of from a federal government standpoint for a couple of years but the stick is well to replace the word stick with coercion which is the piece that the u.s supreme court took out but let's look at the carrot the carrot is hey we're going to give you 100 percent payment from the federal government right you mean the federal government that's 17 trillion dollars in debt all right so i come from 18 years of congressional experience and if I'm a congressman four, six, eight, ten years down the road and we have a new president and we get into fiscal problems at the federal government or greater fiscal problems at the federal government, where do you think they're going to look for money? So that's no longer free money. The federal government's no longer going to pay 100% of these Medicaid bills, 90%, 85%, or maybe we get down to the 65% you know, percent that they're currently paying now. That means the states have to come up with 35% or, or more or 10 or 15 or 20% that's not free money. So the problem with that line of reasoning is that the federal match rate is set by Don't law. Don't make it personal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but it, I think it's important for people to understand because we've heard that from folks. And that match rate is set by law. So it would actually take an act of Congress to change that rate, uh, and sit, which is not so easy to do. Anyone who's watched Congress try to pass a law, it's not a simple thing. Uh, and Medicaid has been around since the 60s, and the federal government has never not come through on their promised share of that expense for states. So let's, speaking of the past, let's talk about the future. We know it's not happening now. We have a couple of hours left in our session, but this is certain, <laughs> certain not, conditions. It's not happening now. So where do we go from here? We're, we, we're not, we never have another shot at this year's money that we could have had. We, where, we, where does the state go from here? Could this pass next time? Well, I, I think if you take the word expansion and replace it with the word reform, I think we'd all be at the table. I think, I, I know our group would be the first one at the table wanting to discuss reform because what do we know about this program? It's an expensive program, it's dysfunctional at best. So if we want to expand, why would we put people into a program that really, where 30% of Missouri doctors say that they're no longer going to accept 
new patients. Let's reform the program first. Let's, let's really sit down. Let's get behind closed doors. Let's get leadership on both sides. Let's get experts from around the state and say, how, how can we reform this as a state and make this a better workable program to get people insured and get better health care coverage? That's where we come from. And so here's where we come from. Uh, first off, you know, we can talk about things being imperfect, but I think if you went to the 260,000 people who are uninsured who could gain coverage and offered them a choice between no coverage and imperfect coverage, most of them would take the coverage. If um, they can get covered. Well, if we expand Medicaid, they would get covered. We absolutely think that this is a conversation that needs to happen. And I think it's true that there's been more conversation around the state than there maybe has been in the legislature, but there certainly have been people in the legislature in both parties who have been serious about finding a way to get this done. They recognize, you know, if you want to talk carrots and sticks, these are big carrots for the state. And they recognize what's on the table. And so what we would like to see is those conversations continue, not next January, this month, next month, and let's get it done soon. Okay, and there that, seems to be. I'm, I'm sorry, I have to wrap it up yeah. to keep us on time. This is a topic we're definitely coming back to, so I appreciate your time on this. Let's go back to social media, get your voice back into the conversation. All right, we are back in the studio going back to Google Hangout, actually, with uh, Sean Nicholson, the executive director of Progress Missouri, but also a blogger with the Huffington Post. And so just to get all of our cards on the table here, anyone who's followed your, your work, we know that you come from uh, maybe the left side of the aisle if, is a way to put it, but that's not the capacity we have you here tonight. We know you have followed this closely. Um, so I guess before we jump into that, real quickly, Progress Missouri, remind us what Progress Missouri does. So we're a communication and research shop. We work with progressive leaders and organizations around the state to, to get good things done. So you also live in Jeff City. That gives you a little bit more time to be with, with our lawmakers. Tell us what you're seeing. Give us your impression of this session. Uh, too much time with uh, the folks here in Jeff City sometimes. <laughs> I, I, think it's a, I think Jason and Scott were right that this is a somewhat anticlimactic end of the session. I think that uh, for all of the big talk that we saw in January, not a lot got done in the end, especially when it comes to the things that Missourians care the most about. When it comes to job creation, um, nothing has happened on uh, the Republican proposal to invest in the infrastructure with a sales tax increase. Um, as your, re your previous panel talked about, there was no real action on, Medi on Missouri Medicaid. So I think from our perspective, it's a pretty melancholy and disappointing end of this session. So Ed brought up in the beginning of the show a tweet that showed the seersucker, and then that kind of touched on the topic that the seersucker suit might be uh, sanctioned. I'm trying to get another S in there, sorry. Uh, outlawed in our state legislature in terms of, you know, there was a seersucker caucus. It was kind of a, 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 a snowball that got rolling there and got bigger as more legislators were wearing the seersucker suit. I bring all of this up to say there are always what some from the outside looking in might think are silly bills going on in the state legislative session, but was this one any different? Was this one any sillier, or is there wasted time in this session? Well, I think that this uh, amendment from Senator McKenna, uh, Brian McKenna from Jefferson County, was a genuinely good-natured amendment, and it was uh, uh, jovial and, and intended as fun. I think there are a lot of silly uh, proposals that were put forward with real malice of intent, things like banning uh, Agenda 21, a non-binding United Nations resolution from 1992. There was all sorts of floor time on that. They sent that to the governor. There was a bill that was sent to the governor to ban Sharia law. Um, I think stuff like this is total nonsense and, and really uh, is intended to rile up um, the, the fringe and it's, it's pretty silly, and there are, especially when there are real things that the legislature could be working on. I feel like I, I have to say, though, there are obviously people who wouldn't consider that fringe, but I, 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 under, I appreciate your perspective. Um, sure. Talk about something we haven't talked too much about tonight, right-to-work laws. You know, that was something that uh, here in downtown St. Louis we saw rallies about right-to-work for and against and didn't really see a lot of news out of this session. True? Un untrue? 
Well, I think the real news is that the bipartisan opposition to so-called right to work uh, continues, and the reason that there wasn't any legislative activity was because leaders and workers and pastors and community leaders all got together um, to talk to their legislators, Republican and Democratic legislators, to tell them that this isn't the, the thing that Missourians want. Um, there is a, there's clearly a national push by some groups. Um, that's why we've seen things in Wisconsin, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, and Missouri was um, and still may be next on the wish list for some of the folks that are, that are pushing these, these um, bills. But even yesterday, um, I don't think it was mentioned by, by Jason or Scott, there was something of a, a proxy vote on right to work. It was a, an amendment that targeted just the Kansas City Police Department, and that only got 85 votes in the House, um, a House that has overwhelming Republican majorities. Um, there was still a very large bipartisan opposition to that. That, that means nothing's going to go through Governor Nixon, um, and that that's not going to become law um, unless they send it to the ballot and spend a ton of money to make it happen. Speaking of how coalitions form, can you talk a little bit about rural versus urban and, and how those two groups, do they come together or do they stay apart once they get to the city that you live in? So I, there certainly is some tension, I think. In Medicaid, for example, there are different forces at play for legislators who represent rural hospitals that are really going to feel uh, the pinch from the changes in the formula for uh, hospital payments. So I think there are more opportunities for Republican legislators who might be really conservative on a lot of other issues uh, to come together with uh, progressives, with moderates, um, together to, that will form the coalition to move Medicaid forward. I think on other issues, uh, we saw even in the, the sales tax debate on whether or not to increase the sales tax, there was some conversations about St. Louis area. There might be more sales tax revenue that goes into the state. Um, does St. Louis get the same amount back? Um, I think there's a lot of good reasons um, that's a, there's a lot of reasons why that isn't the, the most, that's not the best way to think about some of these issues, but, but certainly there are tensions between regions. Uh, something else that uh, caused some tension and that we haven't talked about tonight, the uh, Department of Revenue found itself in the center of this legislative session over some conceal and carry IDs that were scanned into the system and, and, and potentially turned over to the federal authorities in an inappropriate way, depending on what, uh, what happened and who you believe. What, Talk about that. Can you get us up to speed on that, and where does that stand now? Is that is that tied up with a nice bow and, and, and done? So I think the, the legislative piece, um, the actual policy changes, that I think there's some clarity on that. A bill was sent to the governor earlier this week saying the Department of Revenue can no longer scan and keep um, documents when they process uh, driver's licenses. So the legislature did decide, um, I think with bipartisan um, support, to, to make some changes in that practices. I do think that there will continue to be um, a, a certain amount of political grandstanding um, in the summer and the fall around this issue. I think it's not a coincidence that two of the drivers of the controversy in the House and the Senate are both uh, possibly running for the same office in the same primary in 2016. So I think that there, there's a certain uh, perhaps friendly competition between uh, Senator Kurt Schaefer from Columbia and Tim Jones from the St. Louis area. Sean Nicholson uh, from Progress from Missouri and also with the Huffington Post, we thank you for your time coming to us from Jefferson City. Earlier this week, Jim Kircher went to Jefferson City and filed this report. Wednesday was a nice day for picture taking at the Missouri State Capitol, and with the session drawing to a close, it was a good day to actually see the legislature really busy debating, taking votes. Very hectic, trying to get all the bills in, get them passed, uh, send them back to the Senate if they have to, go over the conference reports. So the past two weeks have been hectic and will continue to be hectic, but that's what we're here for. Outside the chambers, you could also find staffers and lobbyists doing what they need to do, as well as reporters trying to make sense of it all. That's the Beacon's Jason Rosenbaum talking with Senator Mark Lamping of Ledoux. While this is democracy at work, the Missouri legislature is a better place to get your work done if you're in the Republican majority. Yeah, you know, I think we've passed a lot of good things already with doing tax cuts to, for the people, putting money back in their pocket. Robert Corneo of St. Peter's was elected to the House last fall. This has been his first legislative session. You know, we've passed some pretty strong um, gun bills, and we've also uh, tackled the issue of... Um, so a couple pro-life things. So I think we're, we're doing what the people, at least in my district, sent me down here to do. On the other hand, if you lead the Democratic minority in the House, I consider this session a complete 
an abject failure. And that's because Medicaid expansion under the Affordable Care Act, which was supported by Governor Nixon, got nowhere as expected. The last few days of the legislature is anything but business as usual. There's a deadline looming and things happen fast. Bills get passed, they fail, deals get made, deals fall through, and sometimes they do just run out of time. They just didn't get to the finish line. There that was this moment of bipartisan agreement that the multi-year effort to rewrite the state's criminal code, a thousand pages covering crimes and punishments, would not be put to a vote in the Senate this year. Republican Senator Bob Dixon and Democrat Jolie Justice said they would make this a top priority in the next session. The reality is, is that every bill doesn't pass every year. The average lifespan to get a bill across the finish line is three years. This so the end of the legislative session on Friday isn't really the end of this at all. Bills that are passed can get vetoed and the legislature has to return to deal with those. And Democrats even consider Medicaid expansion down but not out. And, and I will say this, I hope the governor calls a special session for Medicaid. I don't know that he will, um, if he doesn't see that there's going to be some movement on the other side. But if there's anything that we should do, we should come back here and work on Medicaid only and get that done. For Stay Tuned, I'm Jim Kircher. Okay, we're going back to the Google Hangout now with Tracy Gleason with the Missouri Budget Project, the Communications Director. Tracy, thanks for coming back. Uh, we've had your organization on the show before. Briefly, the Missouri Budget Project does work to improve the quality of life for all Missourians by informing the public policy decisions through our objective research and analysis of state budget tax and economic issues. Okay. So we really work on research analysis and public advocacy. So what has that analysis told you about this session when it comes to the dollars and cents for Missourians? Um, well, one thing that we're really concerned about and the bill that we think would have the biggest economic impact on the state of Missouri is the massive tax cut that was mentioned earlier. Um, it, it's critical that Governor Nixon veto that bill. Uh, once it's fully phased in, it's going to cost the state of Missouri more than $800 billion a year, which is going to devastate our ability to fund critical state services, and therefore it's going to undermine our state's economy rather than improving it. When businesses decide where to locate or expand, they look for an efficient transportation infrastructure, a skilled and educated workforce, and safe, stable communities. Unfortunately, Missouri is really pretty far behind on those counts. We're reeling from years of budget cuts um, that have uh, increased class sizes, jacked up college tuitions, and left our roads and bridges marred with potholes. So but A lot of people believe really a tax cut can stimulate an economy. Well, that's really not what the economic literature shows. It shows that it's not a strategy for economic growth. There has been some improvement in some states, but there's been a lot of, um, of, of falling behind in other states. Um, so there's not any economic indicators that would really say that this is the right thing to do. And if you look across the state line in Kansas, which has been the motivation for a lot of this, um, all the tax cuts have really bought Kansas are huge budget deficits. They're looking at about a billion dollars less next year than they had the year they passed on. And compared to this year, about $750 million less. So at a time that, that everyone needs to be um, improving their workforce and investing, um, they're falling further and further behind in their ability to do that and that's the same thing that's going to happen in Missouri. Can you make sense, can you distill for us tax credits and what the legislature wants to do with that and we've they sent something to the governor that he has vetoed, can you help us make sense of that? There are some tax credits they were trying to get rid of there. Sure, and you know tax credit, it, it, it's a difficult one because there are some social and economic benefits um, through the various tax credits. And so in terms of tax credit reform, there's not a one size fits all strategy that's going to, to work in terms of capping or eliminating them. And I think it really means that we need to take a step back and say, look, do we, does the state of Missouri have the revenue uh, to fund the services that it needs? And with tax credits, we see that there, we're often pitting one population against another um, when you know the bottom line is we just don't have enough revenue in the state. Um, if we're, we're about $4 billion below the Hancock lid, and if you look at our rate of growth since 1981, if we had just maintained that level of growth, we would have significantly more revenue and we probably wouldn't be having some of these conversations at all. And I think this conversation has a lot more that we need to talk about that we're going to have to flush out here on the show. But right now, in the interest of staying on time, we're going to go back to social media. Tracy Gleason, Missouri Budget, Budget Project, thank you so much for joining us. Let's hear what you're saying.
Okay, this is uh, the time where we get some smarter voices in, on the conversation than mine. We got the, uh, the the community table here. Introductions: Ashley Vaughn, St. Louis University law student; Frank DeGrath, best known perhaps for Count on Downtown, the blog; uh, Nadia Brown, thanks for coming back as well, uh, St. Louis University; and Charlie Hinderleiter, political director with uh, Representative John Deal. But uh, we, you're, you're here not necessarily to talk for him, but to talk for yourself. So I want to know uh, what the table has heard tonight about our legislative session that has piqued your interest or made you mad, perhaps? Well, uh, shall I start? <laughs> Not all at once, please. <laughs> I think it's, uh, it's a little short-sighted. Uh, it's disappointing. Uh, Missouri historic tax credits, for instance, might have been, is, is maybe the most successful tax credit program in history. Uh, generates a dollar fifty per, for every dollar that's that's invested in it. That's just bad, bad business choice. You know, to 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 do away with that. This is what people can, people can see the evidence of this. Would you say when you drive down, say Washington Avenue, and you see the re rehabilitated buildings there, or in different neighborhoods that have come back throughout all parts of the city? Yeah, and it's not just St. Louis. It's all over the state. It's Kansas City. It's Springfield. It's Herman. It's 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 a successful program all over the state. And uh, I think, uh, you know, I thought this session was about creating jobs. Well, I, I don't see anything that's passed so far that's really about creating jobs. Like Medicare, not expanding Medicare, it's going to cost a lot of jobs. Medicaid, but I know what you're oh, saying. Oh, sorry, Medicaid, sorry. Okay. And, and it's going to flood emergency rooms with the uninsured, which is much more expensive than expanding Medicare. So it's, as I said, it's, it all seems very short-sighted. I think two of the biggest things that we've seen so far is today the second injury fund fix that was passed. I think that's a huge thing. That's something the legislature's been trying to do for the better part of a decade. And finally today they were successful in doing that. Uh, is that really going to, am I going to, does that impact us? I, that's something I, I think most people don't even understand what it is. It's, it's one that I don't think most people do understand what it is. And I think that's one of the reasons why perhaps the legislature has not been able to get movement on that before. But this is something that I think is a success of bipartisanship. Um, uh, Treasurer Zweifel uh, and Adger Attorney General Coster, both today, both Democrats came out praising the bipartisan vote by both uh, uh, the Republicans and about half the Democrats in the House. So I think this is one area where we have seen success on a long-term problem that we've seen uh, that, that was done in a bipartisan fashion. And I think that's something that maybe we haven't seen as many examples of this session. It might be hard to uh, sell to people that this was a bipartisan session based on something that they haven't really heard of or know about. I, I, do you, what's your sense of things otherwise? Well, there's not really much the Democrats and the legislature can do except be bipartisan because there are so few of them. It's not like they can even be obstructionists to the Republican agenda in the House. They get a little bit more leeway in the Senate. but. What, are they, what else are they going to do? It's not like many of their bills are going to get passed. We've seen several Democratic priorities that didn't even make it to hearings. Right. Mm -hmm. I think Missouri is um, much different than some other states in the nation where the Republicans in Missouri seem to be really driven by ideology and not necessarily good politics or good policy. Um, and I, maybe I would say the same thing for the Democrats as well, right? So it seems like it's, it's much more partisan ideology driven by sides, trying to put people first, put people's needs first, and putting aside politics. You mean they are putting aside politics no. somewhere else in the, in the country? <laughs> no, but, but yeah, where is I think, this I think, crazy I think, place you speak of? <laughs> in other places, just think about Illinois, right, where the um, GOP chairman just resigned because he advocated for marriage equality. Um, and it was something that he felt strongly about w as a GOP principle, where we don't see the same thing mm -hmm. here in Missouri. And I think there, there are some differences about putting people's needs first beyond party politics. Yeah, I think they're disenfranchising a large group of people right now. Like, for instance, the uh, circuit breaker tax, uh, which basically keeps more than 100,000, you know, 65 plus, 100% uh, disabled veterans in their houses. It's an average of like $500 a year that these people really need to, right, to, keep, to keep a roof over their head. Otherwise, they would have to go to care, which is much more expensive. Again, right. short-sighted. But it's only $57 million a year. But it's okay to give Paul McKee a developer, one person that has not created one job yet, fifty million dollars extra on top of the forty-one that he already got. And I, I don't. You're talking know, about the land assembly tax credit, which exactly. has not passed yet. I do not believe. Well, they just uh, SB 112 has now just passed the House, and uh, the fifty-one uh, tax credit for Paul McKee is in there. So the Senate still is debating, I think, as we speak. But uh, and I don't doubt uh, uh, Mr. McKee's motives. I think his motives are are fine. But it's just. 
how can you make these choices? Are there other priorities? And I think, and I think that's what I hear you saying. Mm -hmm. right? there, there are some real life or death issues for ordinary American citizens that live in Missouri that are being um, overlooked in, in the essence of trying to protect wealthy business owners or people with political clout. So that's putting other people's needs in front of ordinary average Missouri citizens. Okay, let's leave it there because I want to get back on time and get back to social media. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Don't go too far. Thank you. Okay, I think Nadia's comment about Illinois might have been our first tonight. We've uh, neglected our Illinois audience for sure. So let's go to Amanda Venicky with uh, Illinois Public Radio. Back to Google Hangout. Hi, Amanda. Thanks for coming back with us. We appreciate it. Uh, Hi, thanks for having me. Catch us up. We, you know, we're wrapping up by tomorrow in Missouri. Where are we in Illinois? Sadly, in Illinois, or perhaps for the best, depending on what perspective you're looking at it from, we have a ways to go. Session actually ends May 31st, or at least it's expected to. You never know if they'll go over, of course. So we have a, a long way to go. In some ways, May 31st seems just around the corner, and yet Illinois has a lot left to accomplish by that point in time. Marriage equality has been in the headlines. We just heard that brought up at the community table there. Catch us up to speed there in Illinois. Well, so in Illinois, we've already had it pass one chamber in the Senate that was a vote taken back in Valentine's Day, and there was a lot of momentum. However, we haven't seen an actual vote taken in the House. The um, House sponsor of the measure says that he's not going to call it until there are the votes. I expect that that is closely aligned with so many other things that are going on in the state capitol. Um, yes, of course, marriage equality, gay marriage, however you want to term it, is something that in a lot of areas is, is a moral issue for a lot of legislators. But let's get real, it's also a lot about politics. And so you have a lot of legislators who are hearing from, for instance, their churches, African-American and Latino legislators who are hearing from their pastors, don't you dare vote for this. And those are big, powerful constituencies, especially when you look at Chicago legislators. Um, and at the same time, it's maybe something that they could waver on if they got something in return that would please their constituents. So I expect that the vote will come once you hear more on some of the other issues that are waiting to be worked out, primarily the budget and pensions. And perhaps once the deadline is upon them, as Jim Kircher reported from Jeff City, sometimes that can be a motivator. Oh, yes. I um, like to say that reporters, by our very nature, are very deadline-driven. But I think that even more so, legislators are procrastinators <laughs> extraordinaire. They really need to sometimes be brought kicking and streaming, screaming to reach a deal. And that's what you get sometimes. That's what it takes to reach a compromise. The crucible of the deadline, perhaps. Okay, so what are the other headlines in Illinois? What has been accomplished? What has been discussed? Well, um, what we really, what we still, I think at this point is what we still have left on the table. And so um, there has been a deal on hydraulic fracturing. And so that's something that we thought there had been agreements on before, but it appears as if now there's really another one that has been spelled out. And the expectation is that Illinois will pass some very strict, at least some people say regulations. Of course, you have some environmental groups that don't want that to happen at all. Don't want um, the so fracking as it's known to happen at all. Exactly. They don't want, um, it's the high volume um, fracking, breaking into the New Albany Shale, supposed to create a whole bunch of jobs in Illinois. Um, it, again, environmental groups very fearful of what that will do to the air and water supply. So we have that still on the table. Um, we also have, of course, pensions. I know you and I have talked about that. Right. In fact. And so that is very closely tied to the budget. Illinois, despite in other states I know, it's, whoa, California even, their budget's okay. <laughs> Illinois, that isn't the case. We still have a $100 billion pension liability, and so there is a divide between the House and the Senate as to how to deal with that. And unions, at least in the House proposal, are not at all happy with what that would do because it would really take further reductions to state employees, teachers, and university workers 
retirement benefits. So those are um, a, a couple of the big key ones. We still have outstanding issues, for example, with the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid expansion. Um, that is still out there. And also uh, medical marijuana. Again, that is passed one chamber this time, the House, but not the Senate. So those are some of the biggies. I could go on. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, please. The, the, the Medicaid expansion, though, that's expected to pass. You know, widely, yes, because Illinois does have super majorities of Democrats in both the House and in the Senate, and it's Republicans who are against it. That said, I don't think that anybody is taking, well, I don't know, if I was going to bet on one of the issues that's still out in front of the Illinois General Assembly, that is one that, yes, I think I would project would pass. What you're hearing is that um, it's the same arguments you hear elsewhere, that Illinois in particular can't afford to take on these extra costs because what if the federal government backs out? Illinois does not have a very good history of cutting benefits once they've been given. And you have a governor who's willing to sign it if it does pass both chambers. That we most definitely have. Governor Pat Quinn, um, I think you need to look at everything with an eye toward, it seems like forever away, but 2014. Governor Pat Quinn is not officially announced, but he's been pretty open about his desire to stay in the governor's seat, in the governor's mansion. It's unclear if he will have opposition from um, in some competition from within his own party, Attorney General Lisa Madigan, also um, Bill Daley, who was former chamber, uh, who was former U.S. Commerce Secretary and also worked for President Barack Obama, both may be trying to run against him. We'll see if Republicans can eventually make inroads in Illinois because Pat Quinn is very unpopular. That said, he has been it said that he will for sure sign. Um, the marriage equality legislation if it gets to him. He wants Medicaid expansion. He wants a state-based exchange, also looking to the Affordable Care Act. He hasn't weighed in for sure on the um, medical marijuana issue, just said that he's still considering that. And that I actually should also say that another issue on the forefront in Illinois, gambling expansion, that's one, we, again, we've talked about before, Illinois is always looking for more money. Right. I know that would be of interest to Missouri, given that that may for a little more competition right. the board. Pull, pull away pull away from the gamers here Amanda Vinicky from Illinois Public Radio thanks so much for catching us up on the Illinois side of the river we appreciate it Okay, here's the guy who's going to make sense of all of this for us. Terry Jones is back from MOMSO. We appreciate it. Uh, political science chair, I should say. Um, something that struck me was that there was an opinion from the community table that I believe the phrase was ordinary people and their needs are being overlooked. Is this just the perspective of folks who live in the, the city of St. Louis and we're out of touch with what clearly is a different vote statewide when you look at the makeup of our legislature, or, or did, did that make any sense to you? That made a lot of sense. Priority number one for Missourians was more jobs, better economy, and the pieces of legislation that would have done the most for that, Medicare, Medicaid expansion, while it has a social justice aspect, was also an economic development bill, and a bond issue, which is not going to happen this session, which leaves almost a billion dollars that we would have received off the table, never to come again, which lost for 2014, and the failure to date to pass a bond issue to take advantage of the state's tax credits, or not tax credits, but tax standing, and the interest rates. Um, both of those would be, have made the most impact on jobs, they're not going to happen. Yep. Patrick over there is a good guy, and he doesn't want to see anybody suffer. Is there, does there need to be some compromise on this Medicaid situation to get all parties at the table here? Once the Obama administration took the threat of hospitals losing the uncompensated care for this coming year off the table, that took some of the emergency out of it and kicked the can down the road to 2014. It's not going to go away. It's ultimately going to happen. The issue is when. Okay, what else is on your mind as you set through our discussion tonight? Ideology, uh, Trump's pragmatism, uh, the resistance to expanding the health care system, the public health care system in the United States is more important than dollars. Uh, and political gamesmanship, uh, politics uh, triumphed, uh, trumped over policy 
uh, on many issues. There's a lot of gamesmanship going on in Jefferson City, more than usual. Really more than usual? Because i got to believe that's been going on. It, it always seems like we're living in the worst of times, is it? But also there was a lot of gotcha types of actions, of, of hearings that were really unnecessary to move the policies of the state forward. Like? Like the issue with the, the, the Revenue Department. Everybody agrees that shouldn't have happened. Okay, it shouldn't have happened. Let's not do it again. We don't need, made, uh, need to make a month-long story out of it. So is Missouri any worse off than any other states that we, let's just take our border states, for instance, in terms of that political gamesmanship? Uh, it's hard to say. Uh, we obviously know more of what's happening within our own state than the ones around us, but the answer is probably yes. Okay, what else is on your mind in terms of, we, they've got a few hours left. Are they going to do anything in the next few hours that we don't expect? Any predictions for the last day of the session? The bond issue still has a chance, so that would be a major difference in terms of uh, shoring up a very needed uh, buildings and mental health and higher education and K-12 through education. And it's also a jobs bill because a billion dollars worth of construction means a lot of jobs. Tax credits, uh, that's one that gets a little muddy for folks because the governor originally was for tax credit reform, but he vetoed that bill they sent him. I think that's the sort of thing that can be worked out, if not in a veto session, in a special session. Okay. Well, do you predict that we will have a special session? I think the odds are pretty high. Okay. Terry Jones, thanks very much for having us. Thank uh, you for being you. with us. I appreciate it. Okay, what we didn't tell anyone was that while we were having the show, Ed was actually grading everyone's performance. So, Ed, we're bringing you back in. Yeah. I don't know how they did, but perhaps you could tell us what the people are saying uh, about this topic. You know, a lot of, uh, well, I mean, a lot of what we're talking about uh -huh. has been, you know, echoed. But, you know, I think it really, uh, there's a really great, uh, Brian, I think it's Gunderson, <laughs> makes a really great point. point. He said, shoot, I, I'm, I'm woefully uninformed about a lot of these issues. And I think there's a lot of non-conversation about the specifics. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of what passed, what didn't, what got held up, and I think that speaks volumes. You guys follow this stuff closely. Is it hard? Does it need to be that the general population is a little more educated on what you're talking about? Yeah. I, I was there for six years, and it was amazing when I come back to St. Louis from Jefferson City how little people knew about what we were really doing. So. I first of all, think programs like this really help, but we've just got to do more because um, I think that the only way, for example, that Medicaid expansion is going to happen next year or the year after is because people really understand what it means for their lives and what it means for their community. Right. And, I, and I also add that we as the informed public need to make a stand, right? Nothing, no power is not conceded, right? So that the educated public needs to demand more of elected representatives. We don't just need to elect them on one day, on a Tuesday, but we need to hold them accountable to the things that they vote on, what they do, what they say. So in order for that to happen, the public needs to know how our elected officials voted, what are the issues, and that we need to hold these other people accountable because they are our voice. Um, and I think that is the point that I think Brian Gunderson was talking about. Like, if we don't know the issues, then how do we hold the people that we voted for accountable? Well, I would echo that. I think I need to use this. Um, and really say that the first step for a lot of people is making sure you know who your elected officials are. Right. It's amazing how many people couldn't tell you who their state representative and state senator are. Find out who those people are. Pick the issues that are most important to you. No individual is an expert on, any, on every issue that's out there, but find what really matters to you and find out how the people who, who represent you are voting and acting on those issues and raise your voice. It's, it's truly the only way that things are going to get better. Um, okay, so let's go future a little bit. Where do you see things going here? We, 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 our, he was in the minority of the of the uh, in the minority party there, but we heard uh, one lawmaker tell Jim that this was an utter failure. Where it, where does it go from here? 
less politics. Less politics? Right now it's all politics and really we should all band together and, and see what, what are our problems and how can we move Missouri forward. You know, we're, we're not competing against Kansas or Arkansas. We're competing against the world. You know, it's a global economy. And I think we should, you know, always just keep the big picture in mind. Honestly, I think we need to start having a serious conversation about repealing term limits for the Missouri House and Senate. I think especially since the year 2000 when term limits really started to get going, you've seen a greater partisanship in, the, in both of those bodies because they're being driven by big interests and lobbyists and they're not being driven by their actual constituents. In terms of success or failure in the legislature, there's only one thing they're mandated to do and that's pass a budget. And I think that's one area where Missouri is in much better shape than, say, Illinois. We have passed balanced budgets every year. We've passed another one this year. And I think that's one reason why we have a AAA bond rating that Terry was mentioning earlier, let that me we can do these. Let me, let me interrupt you to say stay with us online. We're going to continue this conversation, but we've got to get off the air. Our time is out. Thanks for being with us, and stay tuned. What are the issues that are important to you and to the St. Louis region? Share your... To the kumbaya moment here almost. Not, maybe not that, but at least some positivity. Uh, pick up where you left off there. Uh, Missouri uh, is mandated to, to pass balanced budgets, but other states are mandated and maybe don't quite succeed in that. Missouri really has. And that's why we are one of only seven states that has a AAA bond rating. And that's why Missouri is hopefully tomorrow going to pass a bond issue that will really help create more jobs and improve infrastructure in the state, which is absolutely critical. We can do that because we've been fiscally responsible over the long term. And back to the term limits, you're saying you need a little a little experience in there. I mean, I, obviously people thought there was a downside to having the same person be your representative for life. But is there a little is there is there an upside to having some experience? Yeah, no, I do I do agree that having some having some experience in how the system works is always a good thing. Uh, you know, but to, to your point that you're making is, you know, we're sort of coming out of a period, an economic period in time, where we're sort of recovering, right? We're trying to get some revenues back. We're starting to end up on the plus side. We've had to really scale back our government in the last several years. Maybe it's okay to take a breath. Maybe it's okay to slow down uh, this session before we really start spending more taxpayers out, before we really start unloading on the people that send money, the taxpayer, to, to Jefferson City. So maybe this, this is a time out here. Maybe it's a good time to maybe step back, evaluate where we are, have a good, healthy discussion on Medicaid reform, uh, and move forward. And maybe 14 may be a little different. Uh, maybe we'll start to see some big, bold ideas coming out of in 14. Also, be, uh, we'll have some elections in 2014. That's right. But to put a little rain on the parade um, about the budget is Missouri's con required by the Constitution to have a balanced budget. Every state in the union is actually, and the problem is is that there's a tax, a piece of legislation that's going to cut taxes that's now gone to Governor Nixon, and it's primarily cutting taxes for businesses. And it, to be fiscally responsible is not to t cut those kinds of taxes at a point when we are just starting to come out of recovery. So the problem is, is if we want to continue to be fiscally responsible and have those good balanced budgets and be able to continue that AAA rating, that bill really needs to be vetoed and needs to not be law. Can any politician from either side of the, the, the aisle, the ticket, take the opposite position and succeed in this state? I mean, if what if what the two of them are saying was coming out of the opposite party. One of the interesting stories over the next eight months, particularly over the next four months, is I think the governor will veto an above average number of bills and how many of those will be overridden. And I think you're going to see, as you've already seen, some divisions within the Republican Party about those votes. So I would anticipate very few party line votes on the overrides and quite a few Republicans going over to reject an override on some of this legislation, particularly the labor management legislation. 
think I, if we're scoring the overall session also, and I hate to be, you know, more rain on the parade, but um, yes, yeah, so we have a balanced budget that they're mandated to pass. But I think if we looked at a family that had a balanced budget, but the kids were starving and people were sick and they couldn't afford to see a doctor, I don't know that anybody would look at that family and say, like, that's a family that's in great shape. Uh, and, you know, around at the top of the Capitol, we have our state motto inscribed, which is that the welfare of the people shall be the supreme law. And I don't think that we can really accurately or honestly say that what the legislature did this year was to keep that state motto first and foremost when they didn't do what was most important for the welfare of the people of Missouri. But uh, they are representative of what the state looks like in terms of that's who the state sent there. I mean, we, are, we have a large Republican majority because they were elected. Uh, is this, did they not do what the state voters wanted them to do? Well, you get the legislature that you deserve. You know, like when I was playing basketball, we were complaining about the referees. And you would say, well, then you have to play better basketball. You go to a higher league, you get better referees. And, and maybe that's the same thing. We, we need better education, we need more engagement, and we get better legislature. Well, and I think on the Medicaid expansion, there really was a disconnect. You know, we had statewide polls done by Republican and Democratic polling companies that showed majorities of Missourians wanting expansion. We had over 2,500 people show up in the Capitol asking for expansion. Every hearing that was held had, you know, overwhelming numbers of people testifying for expansion and, you know, one to two testifying against. So really, there was a pretty united cry from people all across the political spectrum for Medicaid expansion. And so the fact the fact that our legislators didn't act on that, I don't think is reflective of what the people of Missouri wanted. And I would add, uh, and maybe this is too political science as a, as a political science professor, um, but there is this uh, great book, What's the Matter with Kansas, that really tries to investigate why do people vote for things that are outside of their interests. And part of that lies in the rhetoric that sounds appealing to people and othering people that don't look like them or picturing other stereotypes or pictures of other people. So people vote outside of their interests based on, um, so people so people that actually will qualify for welfare or assistance programs see these as programs that are really helping blacks or helping uh, um, immigrants and they don't see themselves in that way. So they vote against those things. But these are actually against their best interests because they actually need some of these programs. So part of it I think is, um, and may maybe not wanting to sound like people are voting because they have some kind of cognitive dis dissonance, but they actually they get caught up in the rhetoric and don't recognize they're actually voting outside of their best interests. Yeah. So there might not be that sophisticated analysis of, okay, this is what I need to do because my, my family needs this or my, my children are going to these kind of public schools, but they're thinking in their head, how is this, how is this legislation been framed? And it's been framed as something that's seen for other people or something that is not who I intrinsically see myself as, they will vote against it. You know, I, I sort of feel like a, a, a lone voice in the woods here. I, you know, I, I think we come at it, and we're coming at it, or our group or our members are, are, are coming at this maybe from a, a 10,000 foot perspective different approach to it, of just how we're looking at, at, at the state government or how we're looking at the federal government here. Uh, you, you know, from a free market solution, we, we just don't think that expanding and growing government is, is the right solution as a, as a starting point. Um, there has to be other ways at which, in terms of solutions or free market solutions, to get there. Now, you know, when you, I guess I feel like I'm sort of representing the investor or the taxpayer at the, at the table here at this, at this discussion. You know, we do have small business owners that are trying to create jobs that are overregulated from the federal government, that are overtaxed from the state and federal government, who are trying to keep their heads above water. They feel that their investment maybe isn't going as far as it should, and they're trying to get their, you know, they wake up every day. They go up, they take their kids to school, they go off to work, they put in 8, 10 hours, 12 hours a day and come home and do it again. They're tired, okay? So they don't want, it, they don't want another $2, $5, $10 on top of what they already pay coming out of their pocket. So all I'm saying is, is that before we start asking for more money, before we start putting more people on a dysfunctional broken system, before we start asking more from the investor, the taxpayer, that maybe we should maybe just take a step back and, and, and figure out if there's different solutions without having to go there. Wait, before we say anything else, I'm, I'm sorry, I stepped on my own uh, cord. I need Margie to tell me, are we out of time? Margie, please. I'm so sorry, I, was, I had the volume turned down. We have to go, we, have a, we don't want to go, so I tell you what, let's get a, 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 a maybe from everyone here to come back and talk about this Medicaid issue on a whole show, because I feel like that's in our future, yeah. because we, we don't want to cut off at a, at a hard point, so let's go ahead and end the conversation on that note. Thanks, guys. For being Thank, here. You. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.
Sorry about that, Margie. I